But you alluded to something earlier, um, I think off camera, where you said a lot was going on at Jam Down, which is worth a footnote in every, like every interview here. Like this was a mecca, if you will, of so many people in that moment. Man, I worked with everybody under the sun. I mean, and you had a stage and they were practicing on stage there at Jam Down? J I mean, just the Jam Down artists were. Like it was there, because that was one of the beefs we kind of always had was like, man, these rap shows aren't great. Mm. You know, like maybe you should put on a show instead of just standing there with 30 homies behind you, right. you know, which I don't really know how much they, I mean, you know, I think the most hated put out, put on a pretty good show. But anyway, um, but man, we did so much work there and like everybody came through there. Everyone, e everyone out of Houston, you know, so many legends, you know, do you know if uh, other groups uh, outside hip hop. I've heard rumors of Billy Gibbons and ZZ Top were around Screw It one time. Is I don't this, know about. Was that here at Jam Down? I don't know. No. I okay. No, but I worked with the uh, Gary Moon, was the old uh, one of the mastering engineers at Digital Services. I actually took his position when he went out on tour with ZZ Top because he was their monitor engineer. And so. I had been working at what happened. So digital services became my favorite place to mix. And then John Moran, the owner, would he, I, he would master everything. And so I would mix there, and John and I'd always sit in on the mastering with John for years and years and years and years. And then at some point, I was mixing something in the A room, and he came back, and he's like, "Do you work for me?" And I was like, "No." He's like, "Why not?" And I, go, I don't know. <laughs> He's like, do you want to? I'm like, sure. And so I became, a, you know, employee of digital services because I was just bringing in, you know, contract work. Right. Um, and so then that's when I like, I got to work with like Destiny's Child and like life, like all kinds of crazy artists, you know. Um, and like C Note and I got so many, so many people. Um, and then, but so the mastering thing, uh, John wanted to retire, and so Gary took over, and then Gary wanted to go on tour, or didn't want to, he went on tour, was easy top, so there was no one there to do it. And so John kind of came in and was like, hey, uh, you're gonna be the new mastering engineer. And I was like, mm, you know, I, don't really, I didn't really want to. I kind of liked having somebody come up behind me and you know, double check my, my work. I just like to be there so that I can make sure that it went out the way that my, you know, I envisioned it. One thing led to another and he basically didn't give me a choice. And so I uh, trained for like a year, even though I'd been sitting in for like seven. Um, and then I took over the mastering over there. So now I was mixing and mastering out of there. And at that point, I wasn't really working anywhere else because I was happy and busy just there. And then that became a thing. And now I don't even, like I won't, I prefer it if if I mix something. I prefer to master it. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but I've sent it off before. I'm like, that's not. They took right. it somewhere else, or that's not. You know what I mean? Like they took the vision. Like I, I, that doesn't sound like I wanted it to sound. It doesn't sound like my mix anymore. You know, and I, that's exactly what I don't want to have happen. Right. So now I'm just like, I'll just do it. So. So from Jam Down, you transitioned uh, to digital services? No, I was working at both, and I was also working at, at South Coast Recorders, and okay. I was still working at Uptown Recorders, too. And then, but, I, but digital was my favorite place to work. Um, but I was like fourth, like there was, you know, a lot of engineers that were at the time working out of there. Because that was when like, uh, you know, uh, the ghetto, like they would camp there, like they were doing, you know, they had the C room that was all theirs with Mike Dean and, you know. Mm. Um, and then South Coast opened and that's where I mixed South Side. And he had never, like at that studio, they had never even done hip hop before. Wow. And so, I'm, so I took South Side there and then we did that whole record there. And then everybody wanted to go there because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did a bunch of records out there, and then, um, I mean, but I was still at Digital too. But at the time, they had a, a AMEC console, like a, a Rupert Neve designed uh, these consoles called AMEC. It was an AMEC Big. It was a really nice sounding console, but I love the SSL, which is what they had at Digital. 
and uh, so I was working out of there, but not as much as he, the owner wanted me to work out there. And so he's like, if I get an SSL, will you come out here and work full time? Like this be your main spot? And and throw like, a number on the wall. What, were, what kind of cost are we talking SSL? For the SSL? Probably, I don't, t I, I'm guessing, but probably 300,000. Wow. Something like that. But I mean, that's just a piece of the pie because they're sh enormous. Like we had to cut a, a door to bring it into the building because it's too it was too big, um, and then then it, we also had to build a machine room because it has all these fan like amps and stuff that have loud fans that run the whole console. It eats power big time, um, and then once it was all installed, we still had to have somebody come from SSL and go over the whole thing, which. Uh, you know, probably a lot of money a day for them to be there and, and check it, you know, make sure everything's working properly. Wow. Um, but then I, so then I started working there full time and then we kind of had a falling out. And then I went back to digital and I was, I was pretty upset and I was pretty uh, mad about the music industry because I was like, I, I felt like I just kept getting screwed over. Um, this mid 90s still we're talking later the, probably later like maybe 97 ish 98 it might be worth a footnote right at this same time again this is such <sighs> technologies are coming in right right let alone the mp3 right the internet the cd there's uh mp3 all this around yet but all this markup and, and profit, they're like printing money because they're printing on right. their CDs don't cost nothing. Do they I mean, cost them? The, at this time, this was all still label. Right. You, if you, like, Jamdown did really good independently and then they signed to Polygram uh, for like a record for the commission. And it was a, it was a horrible deal. Luckily, they didn't take any money up front. And so they ended up spending tons of money in all the wrong places. The record label did. And so they got off the deal. And the next album, they were back independent again. Because they made a ton of money independently mm. on Don't Mess With Texas. Right. Because it was just them and Southwest Wholesale. That was it. Mm -hmm. You know, after like a year or so. And I was pretty upset with the whole industry. And I felt like I kept getting screwed over. Right. And I went and talked to John Moran at Digital. And he's like, dude, you're always welcome here. And he, uh, I don't want to get into what, what had happened. But I felt like I lost a bunch of clients and uh, just because of mismanagement. And so he ended up being basically like, you can come over here and charge half what you were charging and we'll still pay you full rate until you get your clients back. And I thinking and I was thinking this that, that was, you know, like it was going to take a while. It didn't. It took like a month. Not just because of the rate, but because all my clients were like, "Where is Mark?" They're like, "Oh, right. well, you know, well, you know, I don't know." You know, and then they would find me and then come back, you know. Right. That's been kind of the the story of my entire career. Well, that's flattering, man. They want No, no, for sure. Signature sounds for sure. Right. And fun. We always have fun. Like, I don't know how many times I remind people, like, hey, man, like, this is supposed to be fun. Like, we're supposed to be having a good time right now. Like, people get super upset recording vocals. And I understand you get frustrated, do the same take 50 times in a row, and it's still not quite right. But, you know, all it takes is a minute to be like, hey, man, look what we're getting to do right now. I tell my kids that they're getting started. I'm like, right, hey, right. Those, it's not fun anymore. Stop. Sure. You know, it's funny you say that, right? It's gotta be funny. I want to do it, right? right. You gonna put on vest all this time and care into things, make it sound right. You know? Yeah, it's it's a different world, especially when you're recording. Like I'm, luckily I'm, I'm I can get along with just about anybody, and um, I'm a smart ass, so I'm constantly making inappropriate jokes and <laughs> and it, you know and it, and it's it, it's a you know, it's a talent to be able to be like, no, man, it's all right, dude. We have all day. I don't care if we have to do this 1,000 times right. to get it right. Like, it's fine. Like, it, there's no rush. We'll, but just think about how it's going to be when we get it. And one of my favorite things to say to people is like, look, man, I don't have to listen to this the rest of my life, but you do. Like, you're <laughs> going to hear this forever. Right. Like, I can go move on to the next project and maybe never hear this again. Right. You know, but this is something, you know, you want to be proud of, like, 10 years from now, you know, so that it's always a... And again, just to remind people, like, hey, man, we're, we're getting to do this, dude, for money. We get to make money doing this. That's right. crazy, you know? Right. 
So after uh, you're at Digital Services, and then is there another studio that comes into play? I, uh, I where do you go to next, I guess? I worked at Digital, and then 9-11 happened, and the music industry tanked. Right. And so there wasn't, and I was only working at Digital, and there wasn't, I wasn't making enough money. So I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to get a job. So I actually went and worked for a post-production house called Cool Films. They did like um, commercials. They did audio for commercials, which was probably the most boring job I've ever done in my entire life. Right. Because I'm used to working with like 48 or 50 or 100 tracks, and you go here and it's like six. You know, it's like bed music and some dialogue and maybe a sound effect or two. And I did that, but paid really, really well. Um, and I did that for I don't know, not long, maybe like six months. And I, but I hated every like the second the studio was uh, like I could eke by on, on what I made at the studio, I was gone. Thankful that I had that opportunity to be able to do that, and I, I learned a lot because it's a totally different environment. Right. But it was very corporate, and you know, it's all like I was doing Luby's commercials, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and um, literally. Right. And um, but then went back to digital. And that was it, man. I stayed at digital and then uh, forever. And they ended up uh, changed ownership and then it moved to Tomball, which I did not want to do. Um, but they offered to pay me a retainer to basically not work. Because it was basically at that time, it was just me and James Hoover at Digital Services. Everybody else was retired or gone. And the studio manager, you know, there was still a staff there, but. For engineer-wise, it was pretty much just me and James. So the the uh, changed ownership, we did, which we had, it was they pulled the rug out from under us. We had no idea that was going to happen. Um, and so I was in the middle of a bunch of projects, and I was basically called all my clients, like, "Hey, man, we, we need to, we need to, we've got 30 days to I, I, for 30 days to finish everything on my plate." So did all that. They. Uh, bought a building in Tomball and like but they still had to build it out um, so that took you know uh, six months probably closer to a year so I was basically just getting paid to not work I mean I was still working on the side you know they didn't want me to work because you know I was under contract or whatever but I would still I'm not gonna let you know if my client calls me and needs something done I'm gonna do it you know but anyway, it was pretty cool. I got to vacation a lot for a year and right. um, take some time off, which I had never, ever done in my entire life. Uh, and then it opened back up and I was never really happy when, when it opened back up. But I still, but then I felt like I owed them something since they paid me for right. so long and I, for not doing anything. I didn't want to just leave them high and dry. But then it just kept getting, I was more and more unhappy. And, I, and plus, I, I don't like driving. I don't want to drive an hour each way to work. And I wasn't going to move to Tomball. So, long story short, I left. They, well, they decided to go all in the box. And I was like, well, that's not what I do. Uh, you know, I, I, want to, I, live, I mix analog. I was like, so basically you're firing me because I'm not going to, you know. They're like, well, you can still work out of here and if you just give us like 30% of anything you bring in. But I was like, dude, I have this computer at home. I don't need to drive an hour to give you money and all my clients hated going out there anyway so that's when I you know th that's when everything changed so I started I had some friends who had studios and I went around to everybody like trying to figure out where I was gonna go and then I talked to John Moran me and him talked about opening up a mastering spot together and I was like, well, I need to find a place to mix. And I went to a bunch of studios and talked to everybody, but no, I was really not happy with any of the places. And everybody wanted to charge me an arm and a leg. I was like, man, I don't want to. And, and at the same time, everything was getting cheaper in the business. You know what I mean? So it's like, yes. I don't want to, I can't charge $160 an hour so that I can make mine and you can make yours. Again, technology is allowing the consumer to build these makeshift studios in their house with right. a laptop and the computers right. are coming in, right, desktops. So uh, I ended up moving, started mixing out of one spot downtown uh, with uh, Stephen Finley, with some people and um, friends. And then I was like, well, I guess I'm just going to move here. And so a lot of gear was bought from digital and put in that spot. 
and so then we had two studios there and I worked out of there for a while and then the main dude from that place bought Sugar Hill and then everything moved over to Sugar Hill and then I worked there until COVID and then when COVID happened that's when I was like started bringing it. that's when it, I brought my gear home and this used to be a spare bedroom and I turned this into the studio and I've just continually upgraded and upgraded and upgraded until I was happy and now I'm super happy so I, I, everything I do everything out of here unless I need to record like a drum set or something I'll go to a big studio so that, you know I don't can't record drums here really right but anything else I can do here right and you said all this happened through COVID you was we were talking about this all earlier yeah um, how you adapted just yeah you know, it was it ended I, up being a good thing yeah it ended up being a great thing for me I didn't think it was going to be but I uh, you know everything shut down I already had a studio like a small mix studio in my bedroom and that I would do stuff that like uh, for, my, for my friends and clients that couldn't pay the money to go to a big studio and then that and, or and I do pre-production in there and stuff and uh, but then COVID happened and then I uh, so I started working more out of there because then a lot of my clients that are like touring artists were like, well, hey, we're just going to work. Like we're just going to do, make records this whole time. Um, and then, so I, so I ended up getting a ton of work. And then, I, you know, I just took all that money and just kept pouring it back and putting it back and putting it back until I got all of this stuff, you know. This just, you know, this took a couple years to get where it's at, but, you know. Bye. Um and it's been the best thing. Like, I love, I'm happy, happy now, you know. Right. One of the things we were talking about earlier, this is so good, you know. It's not all about jam down and hip hop. Right. You expanded that dynamic, right? Can you talk about that? You started recording, I imagine, country at one time? No, I didn't, never or really other did. other genres. I, I never mean. really did country. I did, I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of Hispanic hip hop. Okay. And I did like some cumbia, like I worked with some of the dudes from Cumbia Kings. Okay. And I did, uh, I did a bunch of, even back then when I was at Uptown, I did like a group called um, Taste of Garlic, which was like a pretty famous like rock band for, you know, the early 90s in Houston. Because that, that was when it was like 30, like 30 Foot Fall and Taste of Garlic. I don't know if you remember any of these bands. Not offhand. Um, but like there was a pretty big like rock scene here mm. uh, for lo locally back then. So I got to work and know all those guys, and which, you know, to this, you know, you know and that turned into a lifelong. The, the people don't stop doing music, you know what I mean? Like, so. 10 years later they'll have another band or four years later or, you know they're always moving around to different stuff so i've done you know punk and metal and death metal and i've worked at the i worked for the houston grand opera and i've done orchestras and jazz bands and you know blues I've, you know everything under the sun i've done like every year i used to do a, a piano christmas album for this one guy and it was fun it was great you know wow. i love doing different you know you know, and when you say piano, I mean you're talking about a Baldwin full. It was, a, it, he, was, it was a Yamaha grand piano, yeah. And you had to go on spot, or he was moving this piano. No, no, around? we had Digital Surfaces had a beautiful sounding piano. Ah, okay. And so that's really why he came was for that piano, and then me and him hit it off, and then every year he would come, and do a Christmas record. Wow. Yeah, and it was good. He was a really good player. And the opera stuff was super cool, like, because when they were doing that, it was the, they were recording for auditions. So, like, every year, so it would be the young uh, opera singers would come in with just a piano accompaniment. And they would, th those piano players were, I've, I've never seen anything like it, because they're playing the whole orchestra on the piano. So they would come in and we would record. Um, just the piano and the vocal, and they would use that to send it off to uh, for auditions for like these you know uh, competitions around the world. Wow! So super cool. Wow! Again, technology here. Um, when the MP3 came in, right, it changed the music industry. A lot of people sure. argue for the worse, some say for the better. Can you explain that? transition or did it affect you at all yeah oh well, yeah definitely did it still does and i you know i hate mp3s i always will and it's getting better 
with all the like lossless audio now. Gotcha. Um, but like any time anybody would ask me for MP3, I, like, I don't want to. I don't even want to give you give it to you because people will mess up and send the wrong thing. All it happens all the time. Like oh, so like if I master an album, I'll, I'll, I'll like what do you want? Like what's the final? Like, do you want streaming audio? Do you want a CD master? Are you doing vinyl? You know, what do you need? So all that stuff is a different format for each, you know, application for each whatever, you know what I mean? And so, but MP3s, you know, but, but at least like, let's say you want to do MP3s, at least let me do it. Because I'm, when I'm mastering something, right, I'm at the highest quality that it could be. So if I dumb it down and give it to you for the other formats, and then you take that and dumb it down even further to an MP3, like it's better to take the highest resolution. And, and what are we talking? Ninety six twenty four. I'm not even up to date yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Like You're, that's I what? mix everything at twenty four forty eight. So twenty four bit forty eight k. Okay, right, right. And then I master at ninety six because of the processing. So the processing is you know, sounds better at the higher uh, sample rate, right? Huh, okay. And then so for uh, streaming services and YouTube and all that, I give them the twenty four forty eight wave, then, wave, yeah. And oh. then for uh, like CDs are sixteen forty four point one. Right. And that just is what it is. Um, and I still have a lot of clients to press up CDs. Um, but it has to be, you know, everything has to go where it's supposed to go. So I like, and you know, everything's done over the computer now. So I just email them a zip file, and it'll be like CD masters, streaming masters, MP3s, you know, whatever, what, anything that they needed. And I have to reiterate, like, please send the right thing to the right people, because I can check. So like, if they send the CD masters to streaming. As soon as I log on to Apple Music or Amazon or any of the, the, the ones that have lossless audio, it'll say, like, hey, this is 44.1 16-bit. I'm like, dude, I gave you 2448. I don't think it mattered. You said the wrong file. Right. And, it, and, and it may not matter a whole lot right now, but it, the longer we go, the more it's going to matter. Yeah. Because even because like, like I just found out, which I can't believe I didn't know, but CD Baby won't take 44 or uh, 2448 files. They still want CD. They still want 1644.1, mm -hmm. which is a horrible thing because at least if I send you the, even if you don't put it out as that, but if I send the company that, not the record label, but like the distributor, and they keep that, then later on, because eventually it's going to have to go up, you know, if they want to stay in the game with everybody else. And at least they would have it, you know. And but I don't want to be responsible to six years down the line, like, hey, can I get those twenty four forty eight files? You know, <laughs> which happens all the time. All right. You know? And I, you know, I might have them, but I don't. I don't want to be responsible, to, you know, to have them. All right. Just like that whole the whole Atmos thing, you know. What's that? Running nine or more channels now? I've heard about that. What just happened? Oh, uh, do what now? Atmos. Oh, it's like uh, immersive audio. Like, how many channels they're running that on? It's I don't re I, dude. It's, it's ridiculous. It's something like to I think to, and again I've never done it. So, you know I'm I've only talking about what I've researched. But I mean it's like stereo monitors and then one in the middle and then two facing down and then in the back and then back this way too and then on the sides I think so one two three four five six seven, like nine or ten or twelve maybe. And so, you've done this work for a client? No. Uh, okay. No, they, I've, I've been asked about it, and I'm like, well, first, I don't think it's going to be a thing. Like, I, don't, I think it's Dolby and Apple trying to push it uh, to make it a thing, but I don't think it's going to work. Um, and I, I, I could eat those words. Like, I could be totally wrong. Well, you have to have 30 speakers. Well, not only that, but, like, like, think about it as the listener, right? So let's say, sure, they spend the money to mix it that way, well, the listening the listening environment has to be same, you know, has to be pretty damn good to, right. to take advantage of that. So a couple of things happens there. One is, uh, like, let's say you even put in a like a kick-ass home theater system that has uh, Atmos monitoring. Well, unless you're sitting directly in the middle in a sweet spot, right? You know, if you're a little bit to the right, well, then it's not. It's, it throws everything off. 
and they haven't, and again, this is just what I've researched. They haven't really figured out how to fold it down the stereo properly. So if you mix an Atmos and then fold it down the stereo, yeah, it doesn't something. translate. So then you're, now you're mixing it twice. You gotta mix it for Atmos and then mix it again in stereo. So I, I, you know, I don't know. Which I complain a lot, which is why a lot of movies, right, you listen to, they don't sound right, the vocals are all low because of the way they originally mix it and then they folded it down to right. something else and it's like, ah. And it's like surround sound, you know? Right. They, they was a long time where like, surround sound's gonna be, all, all music's gonna be done in surround sound. Right. And at the time, that's when I was working at that cool film, so we had surround sound in the, of course, for video. And so I got to play around and do some stuff, but it was still, it was, you could do some really cool things, but it's, I was like, what am I gonna do? Like, I, I'm not gonna put the lead vocal behind me. Right. You know, it might maybe like a, a cool percussion or something or, you know, but it's not, the effects are really cool. Like if you have surround reverb, that's pretty cool, you know, but. Who's gonna listen to them the proper Right, and, they, and again, the you know, there's all kinds of, oh, they have headphones now that are supposed to mimic the thing and, and I haven't listened to them, so I don't know, but I don't see that being the same as sitting in a room with really nice studio monitors, you know what I mean? Right. Eight, 10 of them or eight, seven or however many there are, you know. I wish I knew the number, I probably sound like an idiot, but anyway.